not a folk banjo, which is the most common kind. I have one, but it is in the shop being repaired, so I could not get it back in time. So this one is actually for jazz, but it has many of the features that we see on banjos today. Um, and you'll notice that it is unusual in, in one regard, which is that it seems to be built like a drum. Uh, the strings go over a bridge, and on the back it has a resonating, what's called a resonator, which is a big dish, so that when you play it, the sound is projected forward, and it's very loud. And so, uh, as you can hear, you know, this can be very loud, which is useful, and I'll explain why. So although this is in some ways not entirely typical, it has most of the features that we see uh, on a banjo. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the banjo. You may wonder why, in fact, I'm even talking about it, um, because actually I'm not a professional musician. I've written a couple of books on history, um, and I guess I would say I'm here, I guess, in my capacity as a sort of a historian. My background was in law, uh, in which I practiced for a long time, and then I went into teaching. Um, however, I've always been very interested in it, so of course, there we go. Picture of me with a banjo, right? <laughs> so that, that should sh prove that I know what I'm talking about, right? Because you see a picture of it. So what's interesting about the banjo? Well, maybe we should talk about what it is. It is a musical instrument, but it's, it's very American. Uh, and by that, I mean not only that it, was, that it is found in, a, in the United States and that it was developed here, uh, but it is of African origin, which is unusual, but it's crossed with European uh, developments. Uh, and it's, it, it, in fact, a lot of the music that is played on it is a mixture of uh, what was sort of African-American or black music, often mixed with white music as well, European influenced music. So in that sense, it is a very interesting instrument, uh, which is sort of hybridized. Um, and so I think its history is interesting not only because of its developments mechanically, and we're going to look at some of those, uh, but also because of the different music that was played on it over the years. It's still played today. It's been around for about 200 years in one form or another. Uh, it is a chordophone, by definition, which means it has strings. It's a membranophone because, unlike a guitar, the top of a guitar, which is called a table, technically, is made of wood. But this was originally made of animal skin. Some still are. This is uh, a plastic drum head. But nowadays we prefer that because it uh, is impervious to changes in humidity and temperature. So we prefer them because they don't break. Um, but it is a membranophone. And I think it is the only <coughs> membranophone in probably in Western music. I think that's correct. So it has these strange qualities. In the original form, had an odd number of strings. The one I have shown you has six. And it's not, it's, it's a more late, it's a more, it's a later development. The original ones generally have five, and it's unusual to find a Western stringed instrument with an odd number of strings. It also has a drone. This one does not. But when we look at the, at the banjos in the uh, pictures, we're going to see that the folk banjo is unusual in that it has an extra string that is put in at the fifth fret. doesn't go all the way to the end. It stops here. It's a very high string. goes to the end. And it always plays a single note. In fact, it plays G, typically. It plays this note, regardless of the chord that is so it makes sense if you play G. But if I play, if I were to play, you know, uh, say, it would be out of tune. That's actually a feature that we want for certain kinds of 
where the string goes up and stops. This is handy because when you play up at the end at the nut, you never touch this string, which is always played with the thumb. And no matter what notes you are playing with the other fingers, you always get this same note. Sometimes it's in tune, and sometimes it's out of tune. But we want that for certain kinds of music. And so it, it gives a very distinctive sound, which many people do not understand, but they recognize it when they hear it. So this is a typical example of what's called an open back, because I showed you how mine has a big wooden dish behind to make it louder. This has an open back, which uh, is another form, and a very common, and it is quieter, and many people prefer that. It's, people, it's kind of an earlier form. Uh, so it's very colorful. It, be, uh, it, it began as an, Af as an African derived instrument played by uh, slaves in the antebellum South, originally. And it clearly has African antecedents. There are instruments in Africa, even today, that are very similar to that. Um, so clearly, it was brought over from Africa. But during the 1800s, and it was played exclusively by black people, African Americans, till about the 1830s, when it, uh, the white uh, folks down south began to be interested in it. And so they began to play it too. And it spread throughout the country in the 1800s, becoming very popular, particularly as a result of the Civil War, uh, when large numbers of soldiers were grouped together and played it for entertainment. And this isn't a day, uh, nowadays, of course, the guitar is the most popular instrument. But back in the 1830s, the guitar was not so popular in the United States because it had not actually been developed entirely in its modern form in Europe yet. It was being developed in its modern form in France and Italy about that time, even though it was Spanish. But the banjo instead was what we played. It was elevated, curiously, to be sold to middle class families around the turn of the century. And so it was considered an appropriate instrument for, uh, for the middle class that had money, and particularly for women. And it was because if you played the guitar, which had come in by that time, women have to put their legs apart to hold it properly, and this is very improper. They wore long skirts, which is still a bad thing. But you can play the banjo like this. It was one of the arguments. It was also, I suppose, uh, a patriotic Anyway, it settled also simultaneously. At, at the one hand, on the one hand, it was in the middle and upper class families, particularly in New England and up in the north. It also had gone into the countryside, and so country people and farmers played it too in a different style. And it persisted in the country as a folk instrument. 
But rather soon, the banjo shifted, as we see here, into a banjo that has a, a circular hoop. It still has a skin head, it still has the tacking. Now this is a modern reproduction, but these are well illustrated in the old uh, pictures. Um, it's called a tack head banjo. Um, so the heads were, were made of skin. Generally they were dampened, put over, nailed, and allowed to dry, and they would become very, very tight. And you see again, no frets, nylon strings. Now, who is responsible for making this into a hoop? It's not clear. Um, but very quickly, about 1830, this started to appear. Some people say it was Joe Walker Sweeney who did it, and he may have done it. Um, he was the first white man who's known to have played on the stage with a banjo. Others were probably doing it, but he's the first one to be recorded, and he made a living uh, playing the banjo on the stage, um, and some people say he is responsible for changing this banjo to have a round body. Certainly one of his banjos, this is a poor illustration, survives in the Los Angeles County Museum. He made this for his uh, niece, who is left-handed, so we see that the fifth string peg is on the wrong side, because she played it this way. Anyway, he had brackets along the outside. This banjo is not tacked, but instead has brackets like a drum, so it can be adjusted. No frets. No frets. Um, and so he was a, an early uh, entertainer, it was called a minstrel, uh, and there was a very popular form of entertainment, which is kind of distasteful to people nowadays. Um, but before the Civil War, it was popular on the stage for people to dress sort of as clowns and comedians, and they would paint their faces black. And they would use the banjo as a prop. And these entertainments in these old days before radio and television were extremely popular, and they would sing and dance and play tunes written for the stage. And um, as a result, banjos spread on the stage, and people saw them. Uh, here's another example. This one survives from the 19th century. Uh, it is another typical example of a fretless, um, fretless five-string banjo with brackets. This was made in the country somewhere uh, and is actually in a museum. You can see where the head was repaired. They must have glued another piece of hide over there for the, where the hide split. So these banjos you know, began to spread from the stage you know, among the people. Uh, we see this very famous picture of a young man playing one. We see here it already has brackets like a drum. Right? Got the fifth string up here. It's already <coughs> on the five string. So it's become quite conventionally um, uh, developed by this time. Here's a photograph of two boys with a banjo about in the 1850s. Uh, and here obviously is crossing the race line. Uh, this little boy is holding one. It has a huge pot, which was typical of the period. He's holding it upside down. And the reason is because this is a daguerreotype, an early photograph that reverses the image. So he's holding the banjo upside down so that he looks right-handed. He's actually holding it this way, and the peg is down here. And the, the bass string is here. Should, it should be the other way around. So the, the whole image has been reversed. And in these early photographs, many people pose with the banjo backwards to make it look like it comes out the right way. But the peg is always on the wrong side of the neck, so you can always tell. So clearly the, the, the banjo was, was, was spreading among everybody, and it was people were taking it up. Uh, it was no longer exclusively um, the, um, the province of one group. There's a very famous painting that everybody sees in this country by uh, Henry uh, Oswood Tanner. It's called The Banjo Lesson. And it's a very, very famous picture of a, of a man teaching a boy how to play the banjo. And again, we see already by the 1890s, difficult here, fret, fifth string, the structure is already pretty modern. Now, uh, the minstrels used to, as I say, get on the stage and clown, and they sat in a conventional um, position with banjo players and fiddles in the middle, uh, bones players playing a couple of sticks that they shook, and usually somebody playing tambourine at the other end. This man has a triangle. This is an example of Christie's Minstrels. He was a very famous uh, promoter, and a lot of the tunes that the Christie's Minstrels played and the Virginia Minstrels had become folk songs. Uh, many of them were written by Stephen Foster and other composers. So we wonder, what did the ban banjo music of the mid-19th century sound like? Well, you're going to hear an example of a uh, Bob Carlin, again, the same banjoist, playing a, what we would call a minstrel banjo. Uh, and he's playing a tune called Bill Rice's Excelsior March. <coughs> and I think you'll be surprised at how it sounds. It looks as though he's playing it backwards. You seem not, where's my, oh, here's my cursor. Let's hear this. I think you will be surprised. <laughs> Thank you. 
music of the, of the folks in the 19th century would have sounded like. And you can hear the banjo in the background. Yes, 
stages uh, and, and musicians going from into small towns and playing in professional companies. So this is an interesting fact and, and accounts for the spread of the instrument uh, through the United States. Um, they began to be commercially manufactured though. These early banjos that you see were all made by hand. But very soon companies in the Northeast began to manufacture them commercially. And the most famous companies in the old days were probably S.S. Stewart, Buckby, Bacon, Bacon and Day, Bay State. There were a bunch of manufacturers. Uh, and somewhat later, the Gibson Company, which was at one time in Michigan, uh, made some very famous banjos as well. So they became, became standardized, and people could order them in the mail from Sears and Roebuck and things like that. Sears was sort of like the, the Walmart of the early days. Um, there were certain innovations, though. As they became commercially manufactured, they started adding frets to the standard feature. They started adding tone hoops or rings under the head. Not always. One of the reasons this banjo has the sound it has, is because, and I cannot show you this, but is that under this head is a great big piece of bell brass big, that weighs about two pounds, and it is supposed to change the tone. Now, Mr. Stewart said no good banjo needs a tone ring. He made beautiful banjos without them. I will not get into that debate. Uh, some banjos have tone rings or hoops, and some do not. They do change the sound a lot. You may like it, you may not. That's their choice. Um, geared tuning pegs became standard, right? So you could tune it more easily. And they added a greater number of tension brackets. So this banjo has the standard number today, which is, I think, 24. But the fancy banjos had 36. They had so many brackets, you couldn't believe it. There's no good reason for that, but they look beautiful. <laughs> so, if you ever find a, a banjo with 36 brackets or 32, you know it's very old. You spend a lot of time with them. Okay, so these are all in, uh, innovations. Now, what does a banjo look like from back? It's a back view of, a, of one from 1925. This is a Vega, which is a very nice banjo from 1925. You'll see that the neck is attached and there is a shaft that goes through. Modern banjos generally do not have a single shaft anymore. They have two steel rods that can be adjusted. But this is the conventional method. And this is keeps the neck from pulling forward. Okay. So this is a, a good example. We can see the brass. In fact, this one has about 36 brackets. You see how many brackets that has? That's a fancy one. That's a, that's a good fancy one. Okay. They also uh, some develop what are called resonators. So this is a modern banjo. We see the we see the uh, the rods. This is kind of the the, the uh, coordinating rods. This is the dish from the back taken off. So a lot of them ended up having resonators on the back to make them louder. So all of these things were, uh, you know, were developments along with steel strings, which also make the instrument louder. Now there was a debate in the 1800s. Mr. Stewart said steel strings are bad. Vulgar people play with steel strings. Other people, you know, should play with gut. Steel strings have won out. Um, and here's a so-called banjo tone ring. This is the so-called flathead design that Gibson used. It's probably the last tone ring devised. It was patented in the 1920s uh, for jazz banjos. Um, and it's sort of the standard now in bluegrass. Everybody has, and actually mine has the same one because it was designed for jazz. It's very bright. But this gives you an idea. This is put between the body and the head. You can't see it, but it changes the <coughs> And so many people are very excited about these hoops, and you can order them and change them. It's like having a banjo is like having a car. <coughs> you can keep changing the parts. It's not like a, a guitar. You can go glue it together. So the banjo was about to come up in the world, though, all right? So here we have it as a folk instrument. It was on the stage with people who were painted up as clowns, people who were playing it around the campfire or in the military camps. But it was becoming very popular in spite of its perhaps strange sound. Well, Mr. Stewart decided that he could improve the image of the banjo. He made them. He issued newsletters called S.S. Stewart's Banjo and Guitar Journal in which he had articles about how wonderful it was to play the banjo. And he promoted it, and he had stories about people playing, like, for instance, Albert Farland. He is the phenomenal banjoist. He's absolutely 